5, look at the verse. Just Jesus heard that they had cast him out right before. They had, if you read before, and we're not going to look at that, we already saw that. They cast him out. They throw him, and that's not just physical. They cast him out means that he, he is judged like bat. He has just been healed. He was blind from birth. He's been healed. And what does he get as a reward for that, for being healed? What kind of reward does he get? He's thrown out. That's weird. <laughs> I'm thrown out for being healed. Now I can see, and they throw me out. They, ju they reject me. They judge me. And so he's going to talk about judgment. Look at that. These are the judges. We have to remember that the leaders here are the judges, just like we have judges here in the court. It's the same power, the same authority. They are judges. We need to remember that. So having found him, he said, Jesus, he found a man in the temple who was cast out, and he says to him, do you believe in the Son of Man? Notice that the Son of Man is used about 70 times by Jesus in the Gospels, and it means the Messiah. That's what it means, the King of Israel. That's what the Son of Man means, all right? That's from Daniel, but we won't go into that now. He said, and who is he, sir, that I may believe in him? And Jesus said to him, and he knows, when Jesus says in glory, they know what he's talking about, and that they don't like that. So he says, Lord, I believe. And he worshiped him. Notice two things. First, he says, I believe. And very importantly, he worshiped him. He worshiped Jesus. Can we worship anything else but God? Obviously not. What does this mean? The Messiah, even in the Old Testament, the Messiah is worshiped. Interesting. John wants to show in his gospel, and not just John, but the gospels show us that, that Jesus is God coming in the flesh. He tells us that in the beginning, the first chapter. He is God who has come in the flesh. He's the Logos, the Word who was with God, who was God. He became flesh. He dwelt among us. And Jesus says in this gospel, you have seen me. If you have seen me, you have seen the Father. So it's very clear. So he worshiped him. Thomas worships Jesus. Uh, at the end of the Gospel of John, once he recognizes him, he sees him, the resurrected Christ. So Jesus said this, and I hear the words that Jesus says, this is very important. He recognized him as the Son of Man, that means as the Messiah. So what is he going to talk about, the Messiah? Jesus is the Christ. He's going to talk about his power to judge. Judge? Yeah. God is the supreme judge, so is the Christ. That's why he's at the right hand of God. Acts 17, verse 31, God has appointed one man who rose from the dead to judge all people. He's the judge. Jesus says, for judgment I came into this world. See, here's the judgment I came into this world. That those who do not see may see, and those who see may become blind. He's talking to a man who is blind from birth, okay? He couldn't see, but now he sees. In what way do you think he sees? In what way do you think this man sees? Do you think it's just physical? Is it just because now he sees? Is that what Jesus is talking about only? What do you think? Anybody? Yeah. He is seeing Messiah. He is confessing him. He says, I believe in you. That's sight also. This is the kind of sight that Christ came to give to people. The sight of faith. The sight of faith based on the word of God. That gives sight. There are a lot of other people who are blind in Israel that God, Jesus didn't heal. But they can find sight. I have a good friend who is blind from birth. He's a great evangelist. Lane Langston lives in uh, Lafayette. Lafayette. I think it's Lafayette, New Orleans. Great missionary, great evangelist. He's blind. He's a great evangelist. And he helps people open their eyes. He works among the blind mainly. Great evangelist. And I can read his newsletters he sent to me regularly about these blind people, you know, came to faith. This blind people was baptized. These blind people became a Christian. They didn't, they, didn't, they didn't be able to see physically, but they got to see spiritually. That's what we have here, okay? 
And those who do not see may see, and those who see may become blind. So we have the blind man who is born blind. Jesus heals him, and he ends up seeing. Okay? When he says those who see, they may become blind, who is he talking about in the context? Huh? Yes, the religious leaders. Because they're the ones who show the way. They're the teachers. They're the ones who know. They're the ones who say to people, you are blind. You better learn from us. Those types here in this context, those types were the leaders of Israel, and he's going to show later on, uh, they're bad leaders, they're going to be blind. And in fact, we notice that. They don't recognize him at all. They are blind. So people can be in high positions. Key people can have a lot of importance, a lot of popularity, even religiously, and still be blind. It's not a criteria. Now, in a worldly way of looking at it, yes, people think, you know, oh, this one has this title. And he's going to talk about that later on, Jesus. This one, he looks important. You know, he's very religious. You know, look at all the prayers they do in the public. Look at how they give to alms. Look how they do all these great things. Aren't they religious? Well, Jesus talked about that in the Sermon on the Mount. No, they're not. That's just to show off. Be careful not to try and show off your faith. That's nothing. God is not interested in that. It's about titles. It's about importance. That's what he's talking about here. So that's the kind of thing he's talking about. Okay. Some of the Pharisees, now we see immediately the reaction of the Pharisees. Some of the Pharisees near him heard these things and said to him, Are we blind? They're not that dumb, you know. Are we blind? What is he talking about? Okay. Jesus said to them, If you were blind, you would have no guilt. But now that you say we see, your guilt remains. You see the answer? You see what Jesus is saying here? Okay, is that if you were really blind, if you recognize your sins, that's what it means. If you recognize your error, if you would listen to me and follow what I'm saying, you'd be okay. You wouldn't have any guilt. But you don't see any problems. You don't see any problems in you. That's their problem. You can see throughout the Gospels, you will ne- never see one Pharisee, I, have, I don't think I've seen one, who will come and say to Jesus, I'm a sinner. Can I be, can I be forgiven? Who are the ones that recognize their sinners in the Gospels? Is it the scribes, the high priests, religious leaders? I don't see anybody doing that. Do you? Now, later on in the book of Acts, we see a lot of priests come to faith and recognize their sin. But that's different. But at that point, they don't recognize their sinners. So who are the ones? Huh? Well, it's a good question whether it's their eyes, uh, whether it's God who's blinded them or whether it's a blindness that comes from them. It's always a good question. Yeah, well, both are true. Uh, uh, if we start with Pharaoh, as an example that you gave, both are true. The book of Exodus says both things. God hardened the eyes of Pharaoh, or blinded him, and Pharaoh blinded his own heart. So th- both work together. It, God never blinds people against their own will. It's a choice that he's made. And God allowed that choice, but the question is, how did he allow that choice? How did God blind him? He blinded him through the words that he spoke through Moses. Because the words of God is what determines everything. It's not what we see, it's what we hear. When we listen to the words of God, apparently according to what we see here, and even in the whole Bible, when a blind man listens to the words of God, he can, be, he can see. Is he talking about seeing physically or spiritually? So he's not listening. And Jesus says you have ears, you don't hear. You have eyes, you don't see. So it's a matter of the heart. And I think that this idea that Anyone who hears can believe, can choose to come to God. It's not that God, I don't think it's not that God willingly wants to blind some people. I don't think that's what it means. Some people, there's some who believe it like that. I don't. Because I think there's a balance to be kept here. Uh, And I think we have to understand how God functions. 
Uh, God does function, God works uh, a lot, you talk about the prophets, through his word. It's always the word that determines. In fact, we see it here. Jesus is speaking and says, okay, you listen to me, you know? Do you believe what I'm saying? And what it happens? We don't believe you. We don't believe your words. So that's a choice that they make. And God has hardened their hearts through that word. So the word that saves is also the word that loses us. The same word that is a good news is bad news. Paul says that in 2 Corinthians. Yeah. Is that my phone? Shouldn't be doing that. Nobody should be calling me now. That's not, that's not allowed. <laughs> okay, that's good, good point. Okay, let's go over here. Um, now, and he's going to, in chapter 10, continuing that idea of judgment. Now he's going to talk about, are we blind? He's going to show them, uh, he's going to teach about the good shepherd, but he's going to teach about the bad shepherd. And, of course, we know who the bad shepherds are at that point here. They're the leaders, the scribes, the Pharisees, uh, those who are going to crucify him, actually, basically. So, truly, truly, I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door, but climbs by another way, that man is a thief and a robber. The sheepfold is the people of God. Huh? It's, it's a symbol. The, the, the people of God are compared to sheep, and God is the shepherd. So it's the people of God. It's the kingdom of God. It's, it's the people. So uh, how do you enter? How do you enter? You have to enter by the door, the door that God has, uh, has, uh, has given. There is only one way to enter. Now, he says those who don't enter the right way, they are thieves and robbers. Now, let's think about thieves and robbers. We don't always see it like that, but we have to understand that when he's talking about the Pharisees, and we'll see that in other passages, he's talking about thieves. Not sincere, religious, good people. Thieves, they are robbing people. They are using religion for money. Well, of course, today there's nobody doing that. We know that's true. That's, you know, that's not, today doesn't exist, huh? <laughs> I'm, I'm laughing. But this is the problem. It's not a new problem. It was a problem already in the Old Testament, all the time. And Jesus talks about it a lot in the Gospels. So remember what the first thing Jesus did right after his baptism? I mentioned that in the beginning. What's the first thing he did in the book of John? He went into the temple. I think it's the first chapter, the second chapter. Second chapter. What did he do? He went into the temple and threw out many changers. And who was behind the money changers? Who was getting the money, basically? Uh, who, 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 who is letting them come in and do that business? The priests, the scribes, the high priest even. In fact, we even know from Josephus that the high priest family were totally corrupt at the time. We know that even from Josephus. He's not a Christian, a historian. They were very corrupt, those people. Um, it can happen when you get into politics, not necessarily, but it can happen that you become corrupt. Even in religion, you know, it can happen, and that's happened here. So he's going to talk about that. So when he's talking about thieves and robbers, and we need to remember that there was a point when Jesus actually went to the temple, and he mentioned that. These are thieves. These are robbers. They're using the temple, and they're using worship for their own benefit. This is the issue that Jesus is talking about. The one who came and gave his life, the one who had all wealth, became poor and became a servant. He went to the cross. So the opposite of them is who? The opposite of thieves and robbers is who? Is the good shepherd. Okay, so that's pretty clear. He who comes by the door, the shepherd of the sheep, to him the gatekeeper opens. So. He, he talks about the door. We have, you have only one door. There's not three or four doors. And if a thief comes to take a sheep, he's not going to go by the door. He's going to try and enter some other way and steal the sheep. That's the idea here. To him, the, oh, the sheep hears his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. So we, he, we, we have here the voice. And the word voice, you will notice the word voice is repeated at least three times. It's here in this verse. Verse 3. Uh, if you notice, it's also in verse 4. The sheep follow him, for they know his voice. And verse 5, they will flee from him. They, didn't know, they, don't, they don't know the voice of strangers. What, why is he talking about the voice, you think? Uh-huh. 
the voice. A a and the voice is, when we talk about the voice, like in Isaiah 40, we're talking about the voice of who? Whose voice? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Same thing. If you talk about the Holy Spirit, it's the same thing. It almost switches from like the Father to the Spirit to the Son. It almost yes. It uses all of them in that one. Because the, that's right, and you're absolutely correct. Because the, and here's the thing: that you're right because what he, here Jesus again is confirming his divinity. What does he call in John one, verse one? In the beginning was the Word. Important word, logos. So he's talking about, when he's talking about the voice, I think he's talking about his teaching, his word, uh, the word of God. The word of the Spirit, the work of the Son is the same. They're all three divine. It's the word. God is speaking through uh, the Father, through the, the Spirit, and through the Son. It's the voice. So you, you need to hear, you need to listen to me. And that's, there's an insistence on that in the Gospel of John, but other Gospels. I believe in the Gospel of John, if you look carefully, there's an insistence on listening, listening, listening to the teachings. And also, like we also talked about, the contrast between Moses and Jesus is important many, in many places. Not here, but it's important. What did Moses order? That old covenant, the law. But now you have the voice, the word of the Messiah. All right. So the sheep hear the voice. He calls his own sheep. We know that the shepherds in Israel... They had given a name to each sheep, even if they had 50 sheep, each one had a name, which is funny, actually, that a sheep would recognize. It's incredible. I thought sheep were dumb, but it seemed to be pretty smart to me. <laughs> Some animals couldn't do that. I don't think a cat, maybe a cat can. I don't, I don't have cats. I don't know. They probably can. After you call them, you know, 300 times, maybe the dog, you know, I don't know how long it takes for a dog to learn his name, but I guess you got to give food or something. But anyway, the sheep, they recognize they have a name. And each one has its own name, so when the shepherd calls them, they come. That's how they, they be able to bring, to, to bring them together. So that's, that's very beautiful. Uh, there's a, there is a closeness between the shepherd and the sheep. There is a knowledge of the shepherd about the sheep. Uh, there is a care also of the shepherd for the sheep. All of that that's in there, how shepherds were doing uh, back then. And of course, a stranger they will not follow because if it's an, a person comes and they hear the voice, they don't recognize the voice. They don't recognize. They may rec it's maybe the same name. It's not just the name. It's the, it's the voice they recognize, right? the tone, the voice. I mean, if somebody else says your name and someone else is different, <laughs> it's your name, but it depends who is saying your name. Very good. Now. Notice something in verse 6 that's very interesting as far as we have here something about the text here. It says, this figure of speech Jesus used with them, but they did not understand what he was saying to them. This figure of speech, a literary device. A literary device, here the word that is used is very close to the word parable, but it's not the same word. It's more, maybe more a comparison, huh? Comparison is a literary device. Parable is a literary device. There's about seven or eight of them in the Bible, literary devices. They're all different. A symbol is a literary device. So here it's a figure of speech. That means a comparison. Uh, we do that all the time. He's comparing himself to the door, and he's also comparing himself to a good shepherd. It's all lifted. It's a figure of speech. And it's interesting because they don't understand, it says here, uh, he used with them, but they did not understand what he was saying. So because they didn't understand, now he's going to explain. Okay, you don't understand figure of speech. You should. It's probably obvious. But now he's going to explain what he's talking about. When you talk about good shepherd. Jesus said again to them. He's talking mainly to the religious leaders huh, here in the temple. They're all around. The scribes, the Pharisees, uh, the ones who are already thinking of killing him, all of that. Truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. So now, he didn't say that before. Now he's saying, I am the door. I'm the one. Okay? 
All who came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved. Notice? And will go in and out and find pasture. Now, he's talking about something here that he's introducing something here that's interesting. It will be saved. So he's talking about salvation. So he's going way beyond the idea of even the blind man who's healed, the blind man who sees. All of that that Jesus is doing to his ministry, all of his miracles are for what purpose? Salvation. Salvation from what? I remember several times when I was younger, I had become a Christian, I had conversations with people. And one of the things that some people laughed at when I talked with them, what do you want me to be saved from? I'm fine. Okay, <laughs> you know, they laughed at me when I became a Christian. They made fun of me when I said, you need to be saved. Back then I was very direct and I would tell them, you need to be saved, <laughs> you know. What salvation? I'm fine, I don't need to be saved from anything. That's the idea, you know. But how, how can anybody, like a scribe or a Pharisee who is a leader, you know, who doesn't think they have any sin, how can they be saved? Is that possible? Not really. <laughs> they can't really. They can't because they're not listening to Jesus. They're not listening to Jesus. Uh, there's no, is there a way for us to be saved if we don't listen to God? Is our salvation depend on the words of God or not? I think it does. I think our salvation does depend on something called what? The gospel. Jesus didn't just send them out to, to do miracles. Jesus didn't say, go out and perform miracles, you know, and, and people will be saved. No, he never even told them to perform miracles, even though they did. What did he say to them? Go to every nation and what? Preach the gospel. Then what did she do? Matthew 28. Baptizing those who believe in the name of the Father, Son, and then what else? There's something after that. Well, not there exactly, but that's in Acts 2. But right there it says, and then teaching them to observe or keep everything I have commanded you. So it's teaching. There, a lot of it is teaching. But what do you teach? What do you tell people? W what's your basis? <laughs> when you go out and tell people that they need to be saved, and they ask you, well, okay, uh, it's nice to have people like that. Oh, I need to be saved. I, I want to know what that is about. I would love to be saved. What do I need to be saved from? Well, now you can begin something. But when they make fun of you and they don't accept even the idea, well, you're stuck. <laughs> you can't do much more. But when people begin to realize that they are something, there's lostness. They are lost. And Jesus talks about it. I mean, if you look at the gospel there of John, he's not just talking about healing, about seeing, about... He's not talking about having a better life financially, despite what some people preach, about having good health. Is that the gospel? I'm not sure. What does he talk about Jesus from the beginning? When John sees Jesus coming at his baptism, and when he's baptized, what, is, what does he say? Here is the, or this is the, Lamb of God who what? Takes away the sin of the world. It all begins like that. John is baptizing for the remission of sins. People come confessing sins. They repent. It all starts like that. That's the beginning. And it's all throughout. The, the problem of Israel, the problem of the scribes, the problem of everybody on earth is what? Sin. Uh, that's what Paul is trying to show in, in Romans chapter 1, 2, and 3. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Y you know, I think that's probably the most difficult thing for people to accept. Because once people accept that, if so once somebody says, you know what, I, ne I need to do something. My life is not right. I've got pride. I've got selfishness. Uh, I've got sins. I need to, I, I need to solve that. I need once people start like that, they're good, I think. They're on the right track. But that's the hardest point, in my experience. That's the hardest thing to get people to acknowledge, especially with these guys. Yeah. You, you are absolutely correct. Exactly. Yeah. Yes. 
That's so true. Yeah. That's so true. That's it. That's it. Yeah. Mm hmm. Yeah. Right. We're taking away everything. Well, we're going to communism. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Quickly. Very quickly. Yeah. No. No. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. You're absolutely correct. Yeah. This is the whole, this is the whole, let's say the whole uh, narrative in the scripture and it's the story of Israel in the Old Testament. I mean, that, that's the whole book, part of the Bible is all about that. Uh, you read Deuteronomy, it's all about that. You read the, uh, the book of Judges, you read, the you, know, you read everything, it's all about that. The book of Kings, Chronicles, you read, it's all about, you know, you, you, f you, you got into your comfort zone. You, you felt good. Yes. Uh-huh. Right. Yes. There was always a small number that were faithful. So that, uh, I agree. Yeah. You're right. Yeah. Yeah. You're right. Oh man. All over the place. Yeah. No. Yeah. Yeah. Not that God's bringing his punishment above, but yeah. He, yeah. God has gone throughout time is he has, he has separated those people like uh, Cuomo who said, Yeah, I'm a Christian, but you know, yeah. you're like, are you? Yeah, you're absolutely correct. There is a separation there. Yes. You put pressure on people to see what they really are. Sure. And I think oh, yeah. You're right. Is, is that link between sin and death. Okay. And, and I think, I yes. think some people discount sin. Yeah. Discount death. That's a good point. And if you, if you start there, <laughs> yeah. sometimes you can back up why, why is there death. Yeah. You back up the bus. And then yeah. Maybe that's a way to You're absolutely to correct. Yeah. You're right. Death. Yeah. 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 I think you're absolutely right, Doug. It is. Yes. Yes. Yes, 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 yes. Yes. No. Yeah. And you know, that is a message constantly because if you read, like we're studying Jeremiah, we studied <laughs> Ezekiel, the whole book, Daniel, and you'll see, they took Daniel and his friends, you see their attitude in the midst of difficulty, in the midst of vacation. The, the book points out the attitude, the faithfulness. Uh, you can still be uh, 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 faithful to God. You can still bring blessings. You can be blessed even, actually, in the midst of that. Like, like Rita was saying, there, God is there with the faithful ones and, and yeah. Yes. 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 Yeah. That's right. 
No, you're absolutely, I think so, I agree. <laughs> There's no other, yeah, that's true. Very good. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and uh, we are, it's funny because we're even commanded to be joyful, <laughs> as if, you know, like, it, it's part, it's part of it. And uh, Doug is, it's all right. You know, what you can speak, but then your, your attitude, not just your actions, you know, doing good things, but your attitude, your, like you say, why, why have joy in the midst of pain and things like that? Because that is like, that's part of like shining. Because th here's the thing, those who reject God and are unbelievers, to me, they don't look very happy. Do you find them joyful? <laughs> I think there's a big difference, you know, between the believers in general. Those who believe, who trust in God, they have an attitude, we would call it positive. We call it like that, and why not? They have a giant attitude of hopefulness, of joy, uh, they look forward to life. But the others, to me, have a, like, a, it used to be, the, po the Pope used to say that, John Paul II used to be the culture of death. And that's right, it's a culture of death. Spiritual death, mental death, uh, there's no, there's no humor, there's no joy. It's all about gloom, no, I say loom, no, gloom. Doom, gloom and doom, <laughs> that's my English. I would say loom, and loom is something else. <laughs> gloom and doom. I think we need to stop here, probably. So we, we could stop with the gloom and doom. No, not really, but we'll continue in John 10 uh, next time. Very good. Ah. What does loom, by the way, mean? <laughs>